Welcome to Gnarly Beer Travel. <clears throat> We're visiting uh, the Brannigan Cultural Center here in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Let's go inside and see uh, the, the exhibits. This is uh, the late Dr. Terry Reynolds. He was a major contributor and corresponded with the Amador family. This is Xavier's of uh, um, the uh, Amador family. And similar art in the area. Here are some of the information pertaining to uh, the history. Yeah, so, uh, at one time, evidently, there was bullfighting here in the area. Antonio Montez. It's a picture of the bullfighter. Uh, this is highlighting uh, some events that took place over in Juarez, which is only like an hour away from here in El Paso. Uh, here we're hi they're highlighting uh, how they did Othello uh, in Spanish, which would have been very exciting. Uh, information pertaining to the exhibit. St. Jimmy's Church calendar, 1951. And these are the amateurs, I believe. Family portraits, history, yes, circa 1910. Wow, children with their spouses. It's in the previous picture, just a scam. Refugio Ruiz, the Amador. And then we have a paper write up, newspaper write up <coughs> in uh, Spanish. And here's a plaque, I believe, explaining the, the write up of March 7th, 1903. Um, it's listing the, the uh, death of Martin Amador and some of his accomplishments. Kind of auspicious since uh, here soon they'll be celebrating um, Dia de los Muertos, which is uh, the Day of the Dead. <coughs> Here is a uh, family tree. The end of our family. And there's another family portrait. The Amador women. Looks like some correspondence. And it details it here, as I mentioned before. 
Um, it was a portrait of the Amador family, the women of the Amador family, uh, circa 1900. And uh, it speaks of them being siblings here. Um, May, uh, May 3rd of 1904 and 1905. Uh, looks like maybe owned a merchandise company. <laughs> Because I knew her in these pictures. That's her. Um, this is her here on the left. That's her. And then I've heard all these stories about, about this person who would stand on the porch of that house dressed in black. So you knew the families in town? No, I didn't. I wasn't around here then. No, certainly. Yeah. Well, once you've researched the collection, you start to feel like you know. Right, right. Yeah, and the time goes so fast. Here, speaking about the family over in Chihuahua. Mexico. Letter from Clotilda Amador to her siblings, May 3rd, 1904. Sudan and Chihuahua. Interesting history. And uh, it looks as though they owned a hotel. He was a pro pro proprietor as well. Oh, interesting. Very enterprising man, Mr. Amador. You weren't around that because she lived longest. She, she died when she was eight. And there's another correspondence written in hand. Oh, you were. So you could have. Mark Amador to Maria Amador. Los Cruces, January 31st, 1891. Letter to his daughter, dear daughter, Maria. And uh, it goes on. As follows. Very loving and doting father. Another letter to his daughter, em Amelia. Silver City, August 19. 1980, I imagine. Another letter. And here it lists the, the letters. And the Times, Silver City, New Mexico, August 19th of 1880. To Coquita. Also to his daughter Maria and uh, Amelia. Thanks for letting me listen to her. I'm waiting for all the way. I'm just going to turn here and all the music And here's another picture of the family when they were youngsters. Beautiful portraits reserved for history here. Big, big deal. Martin Refugia Amador. They had five daughters and three sons who survived into adulthood, born from between 1863 and 1886. How interesting. Here are different uh, 
flyers or what have you. And it looks as though at one time he was a probate judge in Las Cruces. Here it's uh, noted on uh, November 8, 1895. Donna Anna Cavity, probate judge. Many accomplishments, Martin Amador. So he has a, a rich history in this area. Very well respected. as being an honorable man. Uh, machinery, drawings for machinery that he had for no doubt another business or for, for farming. Brings out he was a politician as well in the area. And some of his accomplishments in that arena. Trinkets and books of entry. Business cards. Many flyers. Denoting the time. Pamphlets. Here's a fine portrait of the family. And this is a register. Newspaper clipping on Amador Hotel opening, Royal Grand. June 11th, 1887. I'll highlight some of the uh, events around that time that uh, Amador was involved with. It's commercial business. Hotel registry. Or the purchase of different events. The finest hotel in Las Cruces. Interesting. They were very enterprising, the Amador family. The hotel. One of Martin Amador's successful businesses was the renowned Amador Hotel opened in 1887 and operated by family members until 1968. Wow. That's amazing. It's a shame it's not operated by family now in existence. I'll check on that later, see if it's still in existence. Even, even under new ownership. Martin Amador merchandise license. Which is uh, 
here's the merchandise license itself. This transfer company. Extremely enterprising gentleman. Here's another correspondence. Wong in Ruiz to Martin Amador. Any <laughs> money exchange of goods. Another correspondence here. Mark Amador to Donna Gregoria Rodello, November 13th, 1861. To his mother. To her mother. The Plaza and Church of El Paso, Fort Fillmore in the Oregon Mountains, United States Census, Las Cruces of 1850. This is maybe it's a uh, register of birth. This is a portrait of the, the area, time, I imagine. The mountains are still there. Martin Amador was born in Paso del Norte, Chihuahua, Mexico, November 10th, 1836, to Francisco Amador and Gregoria Rodella. And it goes on to talk about uh, his citizenship uh, as a U.S. citizen, so forth and so on. Here's some history of Las Cruces. Twenty first century. And how the area has grown. Centennial celebration, nineteen forty nine. Such a rich history here in Las Cruces of uh, the Latin people as well as the Native American people. And everyone gets along very well. There's something speaking about war, rockets, and renewal, explosions, testing here in the desert, timelines. Trinity site explosion, July 16th, 1945. This looks like a female uniform, military uniform. Yep, 
black uniform, circa 1945. Gift of Dr. and Mrs. Robert H. Paul. War bonds, farm labor, home front, definitely highlighting the time of war, Second World War I imagine, since it's highlighting 1945. Yep. Nineteen forty three Purple Heart was awarded to Corporal Robert R. Renard for wounds received in action that resulted in his death. Wow, what a price to pay. This is the uh, downtown area. Back in its heyday, 1931 during the Depression. Corn planter and seed sower. The trade sign. And these are the actual. Things themselves. Farming is a big is a big deal here. The Nak Nakayama family, John Nakayama, his family, nineteen thirties. Three hundred acres of cantaloupe on one of his farms. During World War II, Japanese farmers in the valley had their business assets frozen and their homes searched. Fear of a Japanese takeover prompted valley landowners to pledge not to sell land to Japanese Americans. What a tra tra travesty of the time. Francis Boyer and family Young farmland. Oh. Fabian Garcia and uh, W.J. Stallman. Beam scale, 1900. This is the actual tool itself, the beam scale. Elephant Butte Dam. Let's take from 1915. The dam was completed in 1916. Irrigation and changes in agriculture. Farm Bureau. First bale of cotton, 1924. So they grew cotton here as well. How interesting. Statehood for New Mexico. This is by the time New Mexico became a state, January 6, 1912, it had been bypassed for statehood 15 times. Wow. 
and it looks like Teddy Roosevelt signing the declaration declaring statehood for this what we call New Mexico today. It talks about the railroad area from 1820, or era rather, 1820 to 1914, or excuse me, 1940. Two stars were added to the flag, D12, to represent the new states of New Mexico and Arizona. The United States used this design until Alaska became a state in 1959. General store. The real West. Farmer, the feed store, and this right here, doctors and independent pharmacists mix their own medicines, they ground solid ingredients into powders using a mortar and pestle. These powders were mixed with liquids to make liquid medicines, or mixed with other ingredients and rolled into pills and lozenges. Interesting. Hell. Seekers migrated to Las Cruces at the turn of the century. They believed that New Mexico's mountain air and altitude therapy would care or excuse me, cure tuberculosis. How about that? Architecture. Community Groves, Families, <laughs> looks like they played tennis back in that day. A group of Las Cruces women founded the Women's Improvement Association in 1894. Is one of the oldest federated clubs in the Southwest. Interesting. Kind of like a civic league. <clears throat> Again, we see uh, the railroad era from the early 1800s to 1940. Architecture, families, industry, people building, colleges, New Mexico College of Agriculture, Mechanic, Arts, some of the students. Loretto Academy. Founded in 1870 by the Sisters of Loretto. Again, the Las Cruces College. Beautiful architecture.
report cards, yearbooks, photographs. Missing case casement here. Churches. Presbyterian. Um, Methodist Episcopal. St. Genevieve's Catholic Church and the ornate way it was decorated inside. Chelan Colony, 1884. John Newbro established a utopian colony a few miles north of Las Cruces. He claimed Angel guided his hands to write a new Bible. The book inspired the founding of Shalom Colony. Interesting. And this is uh, one of the buildings in that colony. Coming of the railroad. Showing how the road, railroad made its way to Las Cruces. Billy the Kid, Rustlers, Albert Fountain, Mystery, Pat Garrett, a lot of people that we read about in history books. They were in this area. The Western Chisholm Trail. And there's a, a real western rope. W.W. W. Cox and his ranch and workers. Typical ranching life back in that time, 1849, as well as mining for lead, silver, and copper. Very interesting. And this is an old style branding iron they used to use for branding cattle. Lantern little teacup cups and uh, something to make the tea in oil lamp carbide lamp oil wick lamp excuse me Grand Army of the Republic it's a plaque Speaking of the different posts, Sheridan, Barn Castle, Bennett, Fountain were all members of the California Column Union troops that had marched to New Mexico from California following the Confederate invasion. Upon the defeat of the Confederates in New Mexico, the soldiers spent more of their time responding to Indian depredations, establishing martial law constructing roads and ditches. After the war, many of these troops stayed in New Mexico, married local women, and became leaders of the community. How wonderful. Retreat from Fort Fillmore. There's some Artifacts, artifacts from the time. And there's some casement bottles and stones and what have you.
Sibley Stove. I have to cook with this. Here we have uh, pictures of those that were in the Civil War. Colonel John R. Baylor, Texas Volunteers, Fort Sheldon, Buffalo Soldiers, uh, United States Military Reservation, Fort Sheldon, and the first Bacon's military map of America. Cash box, ledger book, walking cane, wonder buck, button hook, all here in this encasement. Nice walking stick. Old Western Town. Horses and buggies, carriages and what have you. Settling Valley. So Kansas, Colorado, Santa Fe Trail. Mexican Settlements, Donna Anna Colony. Primitive housing of the time. Freighters from the Santa Fe Trail, circa 1844. Mexican rule. By the early 1800s, Spain, Spain's control of the Americas weakened the Mexico Revolt. <clears throat> Regardless of the time and the changes, we still see a strong influence of the Spanish and Native American cultures here in the West, as we know it as New Mexico. U.S. Mexican War ended in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, granting the United States lands from Texas to California. The Gadsden Purchase and the Territories, land acquired by the U.S. after the U.S.-Mexican War. There's a map of that. The Battle of Brazito, 1846, War in Mexico, or with Mexico. Here we have a typical look at the... Uh, Tree line streets of this area, which at one time was the opening of the Santa Fe Trail. Violin, lamps, dishware. Founding of Las Cruces. 1849, U.S. Army surveyors led by Lieutenant Delos Bennett Sackett divided Las Cruces into 84 blocks. Early businesses, Prussian immigrants, Julian Rudenthal, Lozinski's cousin, John L. 
may. At his own little hotel and grocery store. And another picture of John or Martin Amador, 1840 to 1903. Hotelier, merchant, a freighter, and a politician. Don Bernardo Hotel, owned by Louis Crudenthal. In the city, as it once was, Butterfield Overland Mail by a wagon and horses back in the day. Map of the area, stagecoach routes, in churches. San Albino Church around 1850. Romanesque Revival Church replaced the old San Albino in 1906. La Masilla. Frank L. Oliver, proprietor, general store. Cruces Crossroads of History along the Camino Rally Island. Guadalupe Indians, Mescalero Apaches, Headquarters, Camino Real, showing Mexico and how they were kind of conjoined. Pablo Revolt. Sagebrush and different desert plants. Early inhabitants. Manzo Indians. Early inhabitants. Crossroads of history in Las Cruces. And Influential people that helped build this area. A celebration of souls, Day of the Dead in southern Mexico. Fiesta de las Almas, de la Dia de los Muertos en el Sur de Mexico. And this is uh, has scrapbooks and a setup for the celebration. Cool. October 31st. It's a Different types of food. Spirits of deceased infants and children follow a path of marigolds, home to altars de decorated with candies, sweet tamales, milk, and other treats. October 31st and November 1st, families decorate and light candles at the graves of children. November 1st, noon. Different food is set out at homes, uh, like little altars to draw home adult spirits. Families go to the cemetery to picnic and light candles at the graves. Masked and costumed people run through town to chase reluctant souls back to the land of the dead. <laughs> 